All right, so I want to welcome everyone back. This is going to be our first and only screencast for Chapter 18. And in 18, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the regulation of gene expression. So what that simply means is we're going to look at whether or not a gene should be turned on or turned off based on the environment that that cell happens to be in. Now it's important for us to understand that gene regulation is going to be a little bit different between the two categories of cells. And so we're going to look at gene regulation in prokaryotic cells and we're going to focus on bacteria in the first part of the video. And then later on we're going to look at eukaryotic cell gene regulation. Now for bacteria being a very simple organism, what they're going to do is they're simply only going to produce what they actually need. And so what's going to happen with them is they're actually going to regulate the production of any enzymes or proteins by two different methods. And one of them is one we've actually talked about in the past. This is going to represent feedback inhibition in the production of the amino acid called tryptophan. Now what that simply means is that if there's plenty of tryptophan in the environment, then that particular amount of tryptophan is going to act to basically inactivate the enzyme in this metabolic pathway which is being used to create the tryptophan and once that enzyme is inactivated it can no longer continue with the pathway and the cell can no longer produce tryptophan. Now that's going to be feedback inhibition again using information from the environment to either turn off or turn on the production of this amino acid. What we're going to focus on in the video is something called gene regulation. Now what that simply means is, again, still using the amount of tryptophan in the environment, but this time instead of simply using that amount to inactivate this enzyme, it's going to inactivate the gene that is responsible for producing one of these three enzymes. And if you basically do not produce a particular enzyme that's going to be found within that metabolic pathway, then it makes sense that you can no longer produce tryptophan um, for that cell. Now when you talk about prokaryotic cells, the way that they regulate their gene expression is by using something called the operon model. Now the operon is simply a cluster of functionally related genes on that DNA strand. And it's going to be under coordinated control by a single on or off switch. And we're going to call that switch an operon. And this operon is going to include something called an operator, which is going to be the regulatory switch within the promoter region of that DNA molecule. So remember the promoter was basically that area of the DNA that sort of encouraged the production of that messenger RNA. Now the operon can be switched off by a protein and this protein is called a repressor and this repressor is going to be produced by a regulatory gene. Now this is going to prevent gene transcription, so in other words the production of that messenger RNA. And it's going to do this by binding to the operator and again as we had said block RNA polymerase from actually creating that messenger RNA strand. Now the repressor can be in an active or an inactive form and that's going to depend on the presence of other molecules in the environment. Now those other molecules have a special name and they're called co-repressors. And so this is going to be the molecule that's going to cooperate with the repressor protein that we had mentioned right here to switch an operon off. And a good example of this is going to be the um, production of tryptophan in E. coli bacteria. So over here on the right is going to be a diagram that represents the um, basic utilization of that particular operon. So normally the tryptophan operon is going to be on and the genes for tryptophan synthesis are going to be transcribed. So in other words what that means is that normally we need to be producing tryptophan and the cell knows that. And so the operon is, which is what is indicated right here, this is going to be active. In other words, it's going to be doing what it needs to do. We're not going to stop the production of that um, particular messenger RNA, which eventually is going to produce the polypeptide, which in this case is going to be tryptophan, because we don't have enough tryptophan in the environment. And so, in other words, it's essentially absent according to the cell, and so we have to inactivate that repressor. Now the repressor is represented by this red symbol that you see right here. Remember this repressor is a protein. And since we have an inactive repressor, it's not going to bind to that operator and we have the production of that tryptophan. But when tryptophan is present in adequate numbers, then it's going to bind to that repressor protein. So it's going to bind to this area right here and that's going to essentially turn the operon off. And so down here towards the bottom, again, this is going to be tryptophan that's going to be present in the environment. In other words, we have plenty. This co-repressor, which again is that molecule, is going to bind to this active repressor. And if you notice, this is going to be the promoter region of the DNA strand. And so once this binds to that promoter region, essentially the um, RNA polymerase, which is represented by this, 
cannot make the messenger RNA strand. So if you can't make the messenger RNA, of course you can't code for the polypeptide, which in this case is going to be tryptophan. So what we had just discussed is considered a negative form of gene regulation. And, but there's actually two different types of negative gene regulation. And each one is going to use a different type of operon. So the first one we had mentioned used a repressible operon. The second is called an inducible operon. So the trip operon, as we had said before, the tryptophan operon, is considered a repressible operon essentially because normally it's on. Um, so this would be considered an anabolic pathway. So a repressor is going to be used to actually shut transcription down, again, if we have plenty of tryptophan in the environment. But the second type is called an inducible operon. And this is going to be one that is normally off, so in this case it's kind of different from repressible, and is only turned on in the presence of a molecule, again, catabolic pathway, called an inducer, which inactivates the repressor and actually turns on transcription. Now the LAC operon, which is what you see over here on the right, is a good example of the use of an inducible operon. So if you notice it says the LAC operon, which is an enzyme that is usually used in hydrolysis and metabolism of lactose. So what that simply means is that if we have lactose in the environment, this particular operon is going to produce this enzyme to basically break down this particular molecule. So as you look at this diagram, the first one we're going to look at is a situation where the lactose is actually absent. And so when it's absent, your repressor is going to be active and the operon is going to be off. And in this case, that would be really good because there's no need to break down that lactose because we don't have lactose in the environment. So there's no need to transcribe that particular enzyme to break down that particular sugar. But if you look down here, if we do have lactose present, then the repressor is going to be considered inactive because we do not want to stop the production of this enzyme. And so that particular messenger RNA can now be produced. So the tryptophan and the lactose operons both involve negative control of genes because the operons are essentially switched off by the active form of the repressor. Now we do have some forms of what we would consider positive gene regulation. So some operons are also subject, as we had said, to positive control through something called a stimulatory protein. And a good example of this would be CAP, a catabolite activator protein. And this is going to be an activator of transcription, in other words, encouraging transcription to happen. So when glucose, which is a good food source for E. coli, is very scarce in the environment, CAP is going to be activated by binding with something called cyclic AMP. Now, activated CAP is going to attach to the promoter of the LAC operon and actually increase its affinity for RNA polymerase. In other words, increase the likelihood that RNA polymerase can do its job, open up that DNA, transcribe the messenger RNA, and thus accelerating or increasing transcription. In other words, the production of that messenger RNA so we can quickly make whatever protein is necessary through translation. Now, when glucose levels increase, the cap is going to detach from the LAC operon, and transcription itself is going to return to the normal rate because we simply have plenty of glucose in the environment. So what you see here in this first diagram is where we actually have lactose present in the environment, but glucose, on the other hand, is very scarce. And so if you notice, this is going to be our DNA strand, this is going to be our promoter region, this is our operator, and this is going to be that CAMP that we had mentioned in the previous screen. And so in this case, this molecule is very high. So at this point, the cap, which is what you see right here, is going to be inactive. But once that molecule binds with this CAP, then it's going to basically place itself in this cap binding site that you see on this promoter region of the DNA. And once you do that, then there's going to be sort of an encouragement of the RNA polymerase to bind, then of course transcribe whatever is necessary for that cell. But if you notice down here, the lactose is present and glucose is present in adequate quantities, the CAMP level is going to be very low. So you no longer have the presence of this molecule that you see right here. So this is going to basically inactivate that CAP molecule. So in this case, because of that very reason, the RNA polymerase is probably less likely to actually bind to that DNA strand and encourage transcription to happen. All right, so what we're going to do next is we're going to look at eukaryotic cell gene expression. So everything that we had talked about previously has dealt with prokaryotic cells. 
So when you think about eukaryotic cell gene expression, what we need to understand is that most organisms that have eukaryotic cells are going to be multicellular. And because they're multicellular organisms, they're going to have different cell types that actually make up that organism, which means that we're going to have something called differential gene expression. And what this simply means is that the expression of different genes by cells with the exact same genome. And the genome is simply the DNA that makes up that particular organism. Now, unfortunately, because of the way it's done in eukaryotic cells, any errors that actually happen with this differential gene expression sometimes can lead to various diseases, and a good example of that would be cancer. Now, there's going to be various levels of regulation occurring with eukaryotic cells. But what we're going to do in this video is we're only going to focus on two. And the first one is going to be one called histone acetylation. So remember the histones were going to be the proteins that are actually used to um, sort of act as an anchor for that DNA. So over here on the right, you can see that these would be considered the histones. And what you see in light blue is considered the DNA. And it's wrapped around those histones, typically in numbers of eight. But you probably didn't realize that these histones actually have tails. And one way to regulate um, gene expression in eukaryotic cells is to add what we call acetyl groups um, to these positively charged lysines in these histone tails. And what that simply does is when you add these acetyl groups, it's going to basically um, decondense the chromatin. And when you decondense the chromatin, that's going to sort of encourage transcription to actually happen. And if you encourage transcription, then eventually translation is going to occur and you're going to produce that protein. And so the second method of gene regulation in eukaryotic cells is something called alternative RNA splicing. Now what that means is that different messenger RNA molecules are going to be produced from the same primary transcript. And a lot of this is going to depend on which RNA segments are treated as exons and which are treated as introns. And so this is going to be our DNA strand. And at this point, all of these are considered exons. And so these would be the ones that we need to keep. But if you look down here for this primary RNA transcript, this is the one that we need to edit. And depending on how we edit that particular primary RNA transcript is going to determine that final messenger RNA that's going to be sent to the ribosome for translation. So if you notice over here on the left, we have 1, 2, 3, 5. So in this case, number 4 was treated as an intron, and it was taken out of the strand during editing. But over here on the right, what we did is we treated number 3 as an intron. And so we edited out number 3, and this was the sequence that we ended up with with this particular messenger RNA strand. So again, remember, messenger RNA is what's going to code for that protein. So what you would code with for this first one is going to be probably very different from what you would code with for this second one. All right, so that's going to finish up our only screencast for Chapter 18. And as always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide.